Well, welcome everybody. Thank you very much for coming. This is the last OCBS lecture of the 2014 to 15 <coughs> academic year. There will be one next Monday afternoon in the Lin Ying series in the Oriental Institute by Professor Francesco Sferra. Um, that's at 5.15 next Monday. These lectures, the OCBS lectures, as regular attenders will have heard very often, we owe to the generosity of Dr. Thet Thet Nui, um, who very kindly pays the expenses. And also, you will all know, I think, those of you who come regularly, that anybody who wishes to join us for dinner afterwards is very, very welcome to do so. We go to a restaurant a short walk from here, and today that restaurant will be Gino's. Now, the title is The Imaginary Mass Murderer Who Owes His Existence to Ignorance of Pali. My first and probably last um, <laughs> sortie into postmodernism <laughs> title. <laughs> This is a study of a Buddhist monastic rule. It shows how misunderstanding of a tiny detail, the failure to recognize a single word in a Pali text, has had massive consequences of several kinds for the Buddhist tradition. I think this is so important that Buddhist experts, which of course includes the entire audience today, must forgive me if I spell out some details at the beginning which they are certainly entitled to consider quite elementary. The most ancient Buddhist texts have always been divided into two categories. One establishes rules for Buddhist monks and nuns, the Sangha. Both the texts containing the rules and the body of the rules themselves are known as the Vinaya, at the top of the board, which can be translated the discipline. In the other category are the rest of the Buddha's teachings, which are conveyed in a huge number of texts, most of which are called suttas. These texts are preserved in whole or in part in several languages, but the oldest surviving version is in Pali, a language derived from Sanskrit. Pali is a form of Middle Indo-Aryan, Middle Indo-Aryan, also known as Prakrit, a family of languages descended from Sanskrit. It is not identical with what the Buddha spoke himself, but is not very distant from it. The words and sound changes with which this paper is concerned could well occur in another form of Middle Indo-Aryan in which the same text, as I'll explain, could have existed but this would barely affect my argument. Most of the Pali veneer has been translated only once, and that is into English by I.B. Horner. Her translation is admirable as pioneering work, but does contain quite a few mistakes, some of them serious. A commentary on the veneer was written probably in the 5th century AD in Sri Lanka in the Pali language and almost none of that has been translated. Though it is perhaps seven or eight centuries later than the text it comments on, it is based on much older material and must be taken into account. A substantial section of the veneer is concerned with the rules of personal conduct for monks and nuns. Those for monks come before those for nuns. The rules are grouped by gravity of the offense, and the groups are arranged in descending order of gravity. Thus, the gravest offenses a monk can commit come at the beginning. Since all the material I'm dealing with in this paper concerns monks, I'll only use the masculine pronoun. The fact that nuns too are forbidden to kill and so forth isn't relevant to my argument. So the gravest offences a monk can commit come at the beginning. There are four offences in this category, and those who commit them are called parajika, whatever on the board, and they are debarred from the sangha 
and automatically revert to lay status without any further action being taken. The several views of the etymology of parajika need not concern us here. Miss Horner translates it as one who is defeated. All you need to know is that whenever I say one who is defeated, that's Miss Horner's translation of parajika. The presentation and discussion of the rules in the Vinaya follow a set pattern. A story is told about some episode concerning a monk or monks, and that story has a bad conclusion. Often it is that the laity complain about it and wonder whether the monks are worthy of their support. The Buddha gets to hear about it and often questions witnesses. Then he enunciates a rule mentioning under which category of gravity it falls. This is not necessarily the end of it. Sometimes there follow one or more subsidiary episodes which lead the Buddha to add to or otherwise modify the rule in some way until it reaches its final form. Then there is a section of text called the Padavannana, meaning explanation of the wording, of the wording which, in the style of a commentary, explains each word of the rule, giving synonyms and examples. This is a code of law, not of ethics. That distinction is often crucial. The most basic and widely used Buddhist ethical code begins with the undertakings, this is the Panchasila, the undertakings to abstain from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct and lying. The four parajika rules deal with the same four areas of behavior, but each has a much more specific focus. The third parajika listed and discussed is about the taking of life, whereas the general undertaking is not to take any life, the parajika only concerns human life. A monk can only be guilty of an offence if he knows that it is an offence and admits to having done it. This admission he must make to the Buddha. Thus madness is not sorry, madness is always a defence. And a first offender can never be punished, because when he acted there was no rule yet. It follows from the above that the exposition of each parajika rule must deal with an occasion on which a monk or monks, for the first time on record, did something which the Buddha decided was incompatible with being a Sangha member so that he enunciated a rule against it. In our particular case, the third parajika, <coughs> The story must therefore show that one day a monk or monks took human life without thinking that they were doing the wrong. A moment's reflection will show us that there will not be all that many cases in which a monk may take human life while thinking that he's doing no wrong. The strange story of the origin of the third parajika. The story which leads up to the enactment of the third parajika is also to be found with minor variants elsewhere in the canon. For instance, in the Sanyutta Nikaya, a collection of suttas, and both versions are discussed in a fine recent article by Bhikkhu Analeo called Ashubagon Overboard on the Mass Suicide of Monks in Discourse and Vinaya Literature. Analeo has kindly allowed me to provide an addendum to his article, published in the Journal of the <coughs> OCBS, in which I cast doubt on the coherence and plausibility of this story. But here I go much further. My article, uh, sorry, my present paper, builds on certain parts of Analeus and couldn't have been written without it. However, I won't have time today to discuss the version of the story in the Sanyutta Nikaya because it's peripheral to my main argument. 
The Vinaya story goes as follows. The Buddha teaches monks a form of meditation, which is always known as the meditation, that's bhavana in Pali, on asupa, asupa. Asupa is hard to translate. It covers a range which includes unpleasant, nasty, unattractive, inauspicious, impure. In this context, it refers to taking a negative view of the human body, beginning with one's own, and it can be seen, and sometimes is seen, as a counterweight to sexual desire. After giving this teaching, the Buddha goes into a solitary retreat for a fortnight. The monks who then set about practicing this new form of meditation get so nauseated by their own bodies that they start killing themselves and each other. Many of them then approach a certain individual and ask him to kill them. In return for which, he can have from each the bowl and robe which are normally a monk's only possessions. He agrees to this bargain, stabbing them with a knife. His name, the name of this individual, varies in the text, and I won't discuss him at great length, but, uh, but a little later on. The hired murderer goes to a river to wash the blood off his knife and begins to regret what he's been doing. But he is visited by a female spirit from the retinue of Mara. Mara is the personification of death and desire, who on other occasions appears to the Buddha and tries to tempt him to die. This follower of, Ma follower of Mara tells the murderer that he has earned great merit because he has, quote, taken across those who had not crossed. Life in this world, samsara, is often compared to a body of water one has to cross. As the commentary partly explains, for a Buddhist, crossing it means attaining enlightenment so that one is not reborn. But the wicked spirit is here confusing that with crossing it simply by dying. The murderer is misled and embarks on a vast slaughter of monks lasting several days. Going from cell to cell, he says, Who has not crossed? Whom am I to bring across? The monks who had not yet attained dispassion were terrified. But those who had attained dispassion, which must mean were enlightened, kept calm. However, oddly, the text does not tell us that the murderer killed only those in the former category, and indeed the commentary implies the opposite, for it says that all the 500 monks were killed. Emerging from his retreat after the fortnight, the Buddha finds that there are now far fewer monks <laughs> and asks why. He's told what has happened. He does not respond directly, but asks that all monks living in that area should assemble. When they do, he teaches them how to concentrate on their breathing, a form of meditation which, he says, is calming and destroys all wrong states of mind. Only after teaching this does he get back to the problem at hand and ask if it is true that monks have been killing themselves and each other. When they confirm it, the Buddha makes his stereotyped denunciation of wrongdoing, ending, as usual, with the new rule. Miss Horner translates it as, whatever monk should intentionally deprive a human being of life or should look about so as to be his life, his knife bringer, he is also one who is defeated. He is not in communion. 
I just mentioned also, probably because this is the third rule of a paragica, this is, sees, we've already had the first two paragic rules, so here this one is also one who's defeated. The text goes on to describe another unconnected episode in which some monks cause a man to die. In this case, they do so by encouraging a layman who is ill to bring about his own death by indulging in an unhealthy diet. The Buddha then extends the rule so that it specifically includes commending death. But the first part of it, down to knife bringer in Horner's version, I'll just remind you, whatever monk should intentionally deprive a human being of life or should look about so as to be his knife bringer, that first part is unaltered. At this point, Horner says that, for, I quote her, for lack of any better interpretation, she is following the commentary. But, alas, she has misunderstood the commentary. However, luckily for us, this hardly matters as the commentary, which offers two possible interpretations, hasn't understood the passage either. There are thus three ways in which one may commit the third paragica. Firstly, one may simply murder a human being. Secondly, one may seek a person or thing to commit such a murder. Thirdly, one may kill someone by commending death to them so that they cause the death themselves. In this paper, I shall now be mainly concerned with the second form of the offence. The third, I'm afraid I don't have time to discuss tonight, but I shall write it at more, about it at more length in the published version. Well then, if we leave the third form of the offence aside, the text that has come down to us cannot possibly be correct. When the Buddha pronounces a new Vinaya rule, he always addresses that rule to the person, a monk or nun, who has done the act which he now declares to be an offence. But that isn't what happens here. The person who, according to the story, did all the killing is not even a Buddhist even if there is a faint attempt to suggest that he is masquerading as one, he is not present when the rule is pronounced and cannot be within the Buddha's jurisdiction. Those who persuaded him to set about the killing are, according to the story, now all dead. There is another important consideration. In a monograph published on the website of the Oxford Center for Buddhist Studies, www.ocbs.org, two monks of the Theravada tradition, the Venerable Sujatu and the Venerable Brahmali, argue, to my mind convincingly, that the narratives given throughout the Pali Canon are mostly sober and coherent. Myths are clearly marked as such, but there's hardly any display of lurid imaginings. The two monks write, the early Buddhist texts are generally realistic and restrained in their portrayal of the Buddha and his environment, and the details do not seem unreasonable for what we know of the historical period and geographical area. So, how did this nonsensical story come to be composed? The answer must be that a remembered text, crucially including the rule against killing a human being, was misunderstood. And in an attempt to make sense of it now, the new material was invented. The problem arose from the words Sattaharakang va asapariye seya that, or the one that I said to you twice, um, or should look about so as to be his knife bringer, according to Miss Horner. But let's start forgetting about that because she's completely wrong. So the problem arose from the words, Sattaharakang va asapariye seya. 
Sotte Harakawa, Sotte Se. I have to account for every detail of this short phrase, so let me clear the ground by saying that in the text, va means or, and it serves to connect these words to the previous clause, that is, somebody who should take a human life. And I, the circumflex indicates that two words have run together, va and assa. Va and assa, just to make that absolutely clear. So va, sa, it is just a phonetic feature of the language. It's va and assa. Assa is the genitive of a common pronoun, and it means of him or for him. Pariseia is a verb. It's the optative third person singular of the verb pariesity, which means to look for, to seek. It is in the optative because its subject is the subject of the rule, namely a paragica offender, and it means whatever monk should look for or may, might look for. So what is still unclear boils down to the first word in this little sentence or clause, the thing or person which is being or might be looked for, and it's a compound. It consists of two words, sattva and haraka, which I'm afraid I have to spend a little time on. We need help from another canonical text, a text which is not telling the same story, but does use the same vocabulary. Unfortunately, there is one. It's the Punnovada Sutta in the Majjhima Nikaya. It's Majjhima Nikaya Sutta number 145. In this text, the Punnovada, the Buddha and the monk called Punna are discussing the latter's intention to become a missionary in a remote region called Sunaparantaka, where they both believe that people may well react to his mission with active hostility. They consider a series of possible reactions in ascending order of violence, culminating in the possibility that the locals will actually kill him. What, asks the Buddha, does Punna think of that? He replies that sometimes people feel such self-disgust that they sattaharakang pariyesanti. They look for a sattaharakang. Pariyesanti is, of course, in the plural, and it's in the indicative. So they look, not they might or should look, but they look for a sattaharaka. And he goes on, tang me idang apparitang yeva sattaharakang ladhang. In Pali, it's a passive sentence, and a literal translation would be, so this Sattaharakam has been acquired by me, even unsought for, if these wild people get up and start killing him. So this Sattaharakam has been acquired by me, even unsought for. <coughs> the natural English, in fact, would be in the active. So, I've acquired this Sattva Haraka without even looking for it. Now, the word Haraka, the second half of the compound, is rather simple. It's an adjective from the common verb Harati, which basically means to take, to take away. But other scholars, ancient and modern, besides I.B. Horner, have given it the unlikely meaning of bring. It's not bring, it's take. They did this because they had misunderstood Sattva. The grammar sets limits to how we can translate Sattaharaka. It has to be the grammatical subject of the sentence. And the neuter pronoun idang, this, agrees with it. Since it's neuter, not masculine or feminine, it cannot refer to a person. It must be the thing which takes away life. So, taking away the thing, neuter, taking away, harakang is in the neuter singular, satta, life. But, can satta mean life? Cut to the chase. Satta is a very common word, meaning weapon. Usually, 
a cutting weapon, like a knife or dagger, and in a context which occurs killing, it's natural to assume that someone, the murderer, is bringing, but hardly taking away, a knife or wep other weapon. But this sutta is quite a different word. And because the misinterpretation of the passages that concern us is so ancient, this meaning of the word sutta, or should we say this homonym sutta, isn't in any dictionary. However, that does, that does not mean that our understanding of it is dubious or far-fetched. Pali is closely related to Sanskrit, and in particular, Pali phonetics is related to Sanskrit phonetics in a regular way which has been adequately described by grammarians. Since Pali has fewer phonemes than Sanskrit, there are many instances where a Pali word is so constructed that it could come from more than one Sanskrit word. And we have to decide from the context which of the homophone homophones is meant. Thus, for example, I, this is only an example, but I'll just write it up so that you see what I'm really talking about. The Pali word sutta, S-U-T-T-A, could come from the following real Sanskrit words. It could come from sutra, meaning a text, a certain kind. It could come from supta, which means a sleep. And it could come from sukta, also a term for a kind of text, particularly a Vedic text, that which is well spoken. All of these regularly and normally give you sutta in Pali. Now the Pali word sutta, weapon, when it means weapon, as it most commonly does, comes from the Sanskrit word shastra. Shastra. In this case, however, sutta does not come from shastra. It must derive from Sanskrit shwasta. The verbal root shwas, those four letters, Schwas means to breathe, and by a normal derivation, its past passive participle, schwasita, can mean breath. So sh you've got the root, schwas, to breathe, and that which is breathed, or breath, adds either a ta, this is again normal, or ita. You have a ch often have a choice, schwasita or schwasta. Many Sanskrit past participles which are formed by adding ta add ita instead in Pali, and the other way around too. For example, the Sanskrit root vas, to dwell, has Pali past participles both vusita and vutta, which comes from vusta without the i. So the extra i in the middle of the word is no problem, for well, that's what the Sanskrit has usually with an extra i. Therefore, Pali Sutta Harakam would in Sanskrit be Shwasita Harakam. But whether you have Sutta Harakam in Pali or Shwasita Harakam in Sanskrit, the meaning is the same and it means taking away breath. In Pali, this is a very, very common, perhaps the commonest way of referring to killing. In such a context, the word most commonly used for breath is prana, from Sanskrit prana, and for example, as all the Buddhists here will know, that is the first word in what in English is usually referred to as the first precept, namely the undertaking not to kill. Panati pana vermani sikapadang smadhyami. So panati pata is, is taking away prana. Thus, we should amend Horner's translation of the rule to read, whatever monk should intentionally deprive a human being of life, or should look for something to take away a human being's life breath, and the second clause describes preparing to commit a murder. In sum, then, my basic claim, which I believe to be an important discovery, is that where the third parajika rule prohibits, lo prohibits looking for something lethal, a means by which to murder somebody, this has been misunderstood as looking for a person to do the killing. 
And this is the origin of the story which now precedes the enunciation of the rule. Note that there's no story here about the first form of the offence, just doing the killing oneself. And I shall show this to be relevant to my final interpretation. So where did the translation go off the rails? The earliest commentary on Sattaharaka is at Vinaya 373 in the Padavannana, that's the word commentary I told you, which comes after the enunciation of every rule, it immediately follows the enunciation of this rule in its final form. Glossing the word satta, it takes it as weapon, and it gives eight examples of things that can be used to kill with. Sword, dagger, arrow, cudgel, stone, knife, poison, and a rope. Well, by this stage, the tradition has gone comprehensively awry. From this development, we can draw an important conclusion. The story that resulted from the misunderstanding is also found in the versions of the Veneer which are preserved in the canons of other Buddhist sects which have been preserved in Chinese translations. I shall soon suggest that one version, the Mahasangika Veneer, contains material which appears to derive from, more, from a more ancient form of the text. So it is possible that that is where the misunderstanding first arose. But I believe it is more likely that it arose from the Pali, ver Pali version. And if that is so, the other versions are later than the Pali version. Of course, the Pali tradition has itself almost certainly undergone later changes. Now a little more about the imaginary murderer. Analeo notes that there are slightly different versions of his name and de decides to use Migalandika. This name is found nowhere else. The word Miga can mean wild beast, but Landika doesn't exist. One would expect a name which is made up for a colorful character in an invented story would have an appropriate meaning. I think that's what has happened here. Laddhi, L-A-D-D-H-I, is a Pali word meaning wrong view. The Pali English Dictionary says it's a later alternative, that is, it's a synonym for ditti, which one could describe as an early Buddhist technical term for a wrong view. In the commentary, the murderer's name is given as Migaladhika, with Migalandika as a variant reading. Migalandika would mean holding a bestial wrong view. The Vinaya commentary explains why this name fits him. The divine acolyte of Mara who encountered him while he was washing his bloody knife persuaded him of the wrong view, the Laddi, that only dead people could be freed from rebirth in Sangsara and thus gave him the reason to go on killing the monks. This does seem neat, <laughs> until one realizes that if he really existed, presumably he'd had his, he had his name before he encountered the deity. And of course he had been committing murders before he met her. And this suggests to me that the story arose in two stages. First, a bogus ascetic is persuaded to kill a monk by being invited to inherit that monk's bowl and robes. Then, someone inserts that he killed lots, some bahuli, lots of monks. And someone else faced with this version realizes that the pseudo-ascetic killer would hardly want to have lots of bowls and robes, so he needs to find a better motivation, and brings in the heretical view that one cannot be freed from rebirth until one is dead. This argument of mine is merely a hypothesis, but it does, I think, show that the story is incoherent, even internally, and probably arose in more than one stage. The story had other absurdities. Though I have mentioned them briefly in my addendum to Analeo's article, I shall repeat them here. 
We know that Roman warriors sometimes committed suicide by getting someone to hold a sword onto which they threw themselves. Japanese warriors, samurai, had almost the same custom. But is there any other trace of this custom or sim any similar form of assisted suicide in India? I ask you, I don't know of one. An even more startling discrepancy is that the story reflects amazingly badly on the Buddha. For a fortnight he stays nearby, quite unaware of the terrible things happening outside his retreat, even though someone arrives daily to provide his food. Not only does this impugn his omniscience, it shows him guilty of a shocking misjudgment, failing to foresee the effect of his own preaching. Arleo, uh, sorry, Analeo mentions this in the notes and text of his article, but he goes no further than calling it remarkable, but he is an ordained monk. It is any comparable episode recorded elsewhere. One can expand on this final point and ask, how is it that so spectacular an event is hardly ever mentioned outside this immediate context? either in the Buddhist texts or in the polemics of non-Buddhist religious literature. Did even the Buddhists themselves believe this story? What does this tell us about their attitudes to their own texts? Even though I have traced a series of stages through which I argue the story which we now read in the Pali Vinaya has evolved, we remain left with the fact that none of this gets us back to the, any version which remotely resembles what I say a Vinaya rule should look like. What's that? Well, I've explained that the Buddha formulates each rule to meet the case of a monk who has misbehaved, and does so in the presence of that monk who admits his guilt. That <coughs> means, of course, that the relevant misbehavior cannot be suicide. Several versions of the Vinaya survive in Chinese translation. Of these, four are the Pali version and three others closely parallel to it. One, probably of much later origin, is so unlike the others that it cannot be used to draw deductions, as the Mula Savastivad in Vinaya. This leaves, as the sixth in my list, the Mahasangika Vinaya, which is ancient, but differs rather a lot from the group of four which I describe as parallel. Those four all have a very similar account of the third Parajika. When I gave a version of this paper in the Buddhist Study Center of Hong Kong University in March, Andrew Ananda Lau, a graduate student, spoke up in the discussion and briefly drew my attention to the Mahasangika version. He didn't actually have any criticism of anything I'd said in the paper, but he had it all on his mobile phone and he he'd looked it up in the ten, five minutes available <laughs> between the end of my talk and the time to ask a question. Admirable. Well, I don't know any Chinese, so I asked my friend and ex pupil, Dr. Quan Zafu, to tell me what the Mahasangika version said. I'm much indebted to him for his full reply, which I'm about to summarize, and it makes a good deal of difference, not to my point about Satyaharaka, but to a lot else. The Mahasangika version contains no less than four accounts of what led up to the Buddha's pronouncing the third Parajika rule. The last, which is by far the longest, is very close to the version in the Pali Vinaya and its three parallels, the version I've told you. That is, monks who are demoralized by the practice of Asubha Bhavana embark on mass suicide, in which they are much aided by a member of a non-Buddhist sect. He's clearly the same as our Megaladdika. On his return to the scene, 
The Buddha diverts the monks to the practice of mindful breathing. The, and now, the murderer's name in Chinese means deer stick, which suggests an Indian original close to Migadandika, which is obviously the same person as Migaladika. <coughs> but what are the other three stories? Since they, they're all much shorter. Since they come earlier in the text, it is reasonable to suppose that they were there first. Dr. Kwan writes, these three stories all state that, atten that an attendant monk was tired of looking after a sick monk who intended to die. Story one. The attendant <coughs> monk killed the sick monk with his own hand. Sort of mercy killing, I suppose. St story two. The attendant monk sought someone who held a knife to kill the sick monk. Story three. The attendant monk praised death and incited the sick monk to suicide. It's immediately obvious that these three stories correspond to the three forms of the offense of taking human life. Moreover, in each story, the offender is a monk, so he can be, and indeed must be, the person to whom the Buddha spoke, reprimanding him for having committed the offense. Another thing that seems obvious is that the three, three stories are variants on a single situation and cannot possibly, therefore, reflect a historical reality. I mean, you can't have the same guy first killing him, then getting somebody else to kill him, and then getting him to commit suicide. One of them might be historically accurate, but surely not all three. This is of general relevance to our evaluation of such vinya narratives which obviously many people have suspected are rather made up ex post facto to provide some rationale for the rules. As we have them, however, these four stories are not presented as wholly independent of each other. Story four, the final long one, which you know, begins by introducing the killer deer stick and says about him, having killed the monk. So story four is presented as a sequel to story two. Dr. Kwan's summary of story two, sent to me in an email, is as follows. A monk was gravely ill. His attendant monk was tired of looking after him and complained. The sick monk said, it would be good if you could kill me. That monk replied, the Blessed One has laid down a rule that prohibits killing mankind with one's own hand. This sick monk said, You can seek someone who holds a knife for me. The attendant monk approached Deer Stick, a follower of another sect, and said, If you kill the monk, his robe and bow will be given to you. He killed him and took his robe and bow. End of story, end quote. From this material, I believe that we can make some extremely important deductions about the development and relative chronology of the accounts of what led up to the third Parajika. But I have to remind you that I'm here dealing with a double translation that is English from Chinese, which is in turn from an Indian language, probably a form of Middle Indo-Aryan. And my argument depends on the Chinese translation being fairly accurate. And there's a further complication. The Indian original of the Mahasangika Vinaya is completely lost. But tradition holds that the Mahasangika canon was in Prakrit, Middle Indo-Aryan. There are several forms of Prakrit with different phonetics, and we don't know which of them was used by the Mahasangikas. It's therefore possible though the chances are somewhat rather against it, that the misunderstanding I've been unraveling began entirely within the Mahasangika rather than the Pali tradition. But the kernel of our problem remains what is here story two. It says that the sick old monk says, 
You can seek someone who holds a knife for me, or at least something very like that, given the impositions of a double translation. This shows that already here, the story is built on the failure to recognize that sattva means life breath. And that failure leads on to the misinterpretation of haraka, which, as we have seen, cannot mean holds. It simply can't mean holds. It means takes. Moreover, we must be clear that we... Ha Sorry, that... Oopsie. Um, so there's a double layer of misinterpretation. After the failure to recognize that sattva means life breath, the misinterpretation means taking it to refer to a weapon and therefore also misinterpreting haraka. Then sattva haraka is taken as a masculine instead of a neuter, thus introducing another person into the story, not just the sick old man and his attendant. Enter Migalavdika, the hired assassin. <laughs> I have shown how easily all this can occur in Pali, and it's possible that it could also occur in the form of Prakrit in which the Mahasangika Vinaya was composed, but as I said, I don't think it likely. I think it more likely that the two traditions, the Theravada and the Mahasangika, have interacted, influence each other, influencing each other. There's also the intriguing possibility that the muddle occurred even before the two traditions had separated. In other words, within a century or so of the Buddha's death. After all, prohibition of homicide is likely to be a pretty basic feature of a legal code. If we refer the text to such an early period, we're dealing with purely oral literature, not written texts. <coughs> and this compounds the virtual impossibility of founding an argument on phonetic detail any further than I have. Basically, a rule which was originally about preparing to commit a murder came to be understood as a rule against killing somebody by proxy. Though it must be speculation, it isn't difficult to suggest how the muddle then spread further. I've argued for a stage at which the second form of the offence had been newly, un newly understood as hiring an assassin. The next part of the text talks about persuading someone to commit suicide. I think it's easy to jump to the conclusion that the assassin, though he himself is said to carry a weapon, is dealing with suicides. Moreover, the assassin leaves the medical attendant with no further part to play, so he drops out of the story. Though my positive evidence for this is flimsy, one can ask, how else did the idea of suicide get into the story which is all about not killing? Not killing somebody else. One final observation then. Is it not extraordinary that down the centuries, a text which deals with so important a matter as killing people, and indeed it is the text which deals with that matter, and yet deviates so seriously from the norm of how a Vinaya rule comes to be made, has been uncritically accepted, so far as I know, for the last two and a half thousand years. I think I'll stop there because it's a bit of an anticlimax to go on to part three. <laughs> <laughs>